Right, uh, so uh, hi and good afternoon everybody. Welcome to the Forte Markets Legal Tech Innovation Journey Online. I'm looking forward to keeping our legal tech journey in action by launching this on our first day of webinars. So today we'll be starting off with a um, panel which is going to be women in legal tech and Brian Dunn is our moderator for this so if I can just hand over to you Brian. Sure welcome everyone um, I, will pro I will try to keep my speaking to a limited because you're going to enjoy this panel far more than listening to me um, I think we've got an amazing panel I'm a little bit biased but I think we have the best one so um, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves uh, so that you can understand exactly what everyone's background is. And let me tell you, it is very diverse, very impressive. And um, I think that's going to make uh, for some fun Q&A. And I think uh, we're all going to learn a lot today. So um, why don't we go uh, kind of clockwise here in this, it's my, I guess, clockwise to me. Um, and so I'll just kind of mention your names and then you can unmute and uh, give a little bit of a sh maybe introduction about yourself, you know, a minute, two minutes, three minutes, whatever you like. Just uh, give, give the, the uh, attendees here some good background of um, who you are, what you do, um, how you've gotten to where you are, what your, um, uh, what your involvement is in the, the legal space or the tech space or the legal tech space. Um, so, uh, Sherilyn, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Hi, everybody. I'm Sherilyn, um, the CEO of Asia Law Network. Uh, thank you to Forte Markets for having me. Um, so, I founded basically asialawnetwork.com due to my personal mission in enabling greater access to legal services. We are the only platform that's approved by the Ministry of Law in Singapore, Law Society of Singapore as the marketing platform for lawyers. When there was a tech program that was launched uh, in 2017, I believe it's called uh, Tech Start for Law. And we have grown the network to a few thousand lawyers on the platform now across the region. And we're working to localize our content uh, for the region. Um, but then we realized that actually there's an even bigger problem to solve uh, in the Asia region. So the problem was that law firms here are technically quite backward in terms of uh, adopting technology for a simple data entry or even keeping track of um, a lot of things uh, when it comes to client management, document management. So we went on to build that platform, uh, a very good backend base, where it's a full-fledged uh, practice management system with a document management system and a proper accounting system. So we've continued building that part um, and now it's being adopted by a number of uh, the mid to large size law firms. And we're still continuing with our work uh, on both, both Asia Law Network side as well as Tesseract, which is the practice management side, uh, to make sure that you know, um, legal services can be quickly, more quickly um, accessed by the people. Um, I think technology can bring a lot of opportunities for the law firms here. Uh, we are severely underserved as a market, uh, not just in Singapore, but across the region. So you, we see legal tech being something that uh, will be very exciting in the next coming years. Thank you. All right, thank you, amazing. Um, Barbara, why don't we uh, go with you next? Thanks, Brian, and thanks to Forte Markets. It's delightful to be with you all. Um, and thank you for having me to speak. So my perspective is very much one of legal services in the supply side of um, things. So I started out in private practice working in high street law firms. Um, I moved in-house um, at the start of the 2000s into a legal process outsourcing scale up um, and then jumped on acquisition into an alternative business structure and from there took a leadership role uh, leading business transformation. I've also been able to um, hold down these roles whilst also doing some non-executive director roles primarily in the regulatory um, side of things which fitted in very nicely with the fact that my route into the law was as a chartered legal executive which is one of the three um, routes into the law in the UK. Um, 
my perspective that I will always offer up is I started out as an office junior who became a secretary and then following a very traditional silex route is I worked my way up to um, a fellow and gained chartered status. Um, so I've been on quite a learning journey as well as a, a journey through the different ways in which legal services can be offered in the UK. Um, and the reason why my perspective, I think, has shaped my experience of legal services is I've also often been on the sharp end of um, bad practice in terms of how services are delivered. And that could have been the junior having to do the repetitive roles. It could have been as you know, providing cover for the front of house staff. It could have been having to walk between different offices, um, sharing exchange checks as houses were being bought and sold. Um, and those efficiency, inefficiencies really shaped my view of how I could really lend some of my personal joy at creating efficiency into building better delivery of legal services. Um, it's also aligned with my love of working with multidisciplinary teams. Um, so I am never happier than at work than when I'm working alongside people who bring the law plus and that could be law plus data science, law plus design, law plus technology. Um, you, you know, the limits are endless. Um, so I have embraced technology. I'm not a technology expert. I see it very much as an enabler to doing great service. Um, and I'll always be the voice of offering up the client's view on how these things might be, be holding out. Amazing. Thank you, Barbara. Um, uh, yes, sir, why don't we go with you next? Hey, everyone. Um, thanks, Brian. Thanks, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be with um, all those really great ladies among here. Um, for me, um, I'm currently an in-house lawyer in a tech company, so maybe unlike everyone else, um, I'm actually a lawyer practicing an in-house counsel. Um, in the past, I was a private practice lawyer, but during a really early stage in my career, I decided I want to move in to move in house. I was um, raised in a family of all tech um, tech people, engineers. I was the only lawyer in the family, and I've always heard those kind of tech language in the family. And I just wanted to see like how really things are being done on the ground. So, and that's where I am at the moment. I established the legal Middle East um, function in Gardner, where I am at the moment. Um, it's a tech consultancy company. Um, I've been there for six years and I pretty much enjoy it. Um, I really enjoy doing things with the sales and the consultants on the ground, um, how and really help them do things compliantly and just really do their job in a very smooth way, but at the same time, not being afraid to reach to the lawyer inside the company, which um, has always been their picture uh, when they wanted to reach to someone in-house. Um, I'm very passionate about women, um, women empowerment in the region. Um, growing up in a region such as um, Egypt is, has pretty much, pretty much um, a very interesting um, experience. I grew up in a very much um, different family, which different, uh, different background. We come from all sorts of backgrounds globally. And I found it very difficult to find a role model that I wanted to look up to in the career of the legal field, um, especially in our region. And um, I also found it very difficult to find a mentor who I can reach out to during my career, especially that I really um, studied a different, um, I would say different aspect. Um, being the only lawyer, I couldn't really find someone to reach out to. And from that point, I decided to be my own, um, I would say role model for other women. I really wanted to be that person for everyone. And from that point uh, of time, I've been mentoring also other women um, throughout my career at the moment. I help, um, I'm a mentor in a network called Elevate, um, uh, empowering other women, helping them throughout their career and deciding what they wanted to do. Um, I'm also a mentor in another group called the Link Group. Again, helping women really find out what they want to do, empowering them, making their own decisions. Cause this is something that I felt difficult um, to do and reach out uh, when I was at a certain point of my career. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. I never thought, um, to be honest, to reach where I am at the moment, being that um, award-winning lawyer, um, really before I reach out my 30s, um, and that's probably surprising information to a lot of people, but um, I became really the model that I wanted to be, yeah. 
Amazing. Um, Caroline, why don't we hear about from you next? That's really great to hear that. <laughs> um, yeah, hi, Caroline Hill. Um, I'm Editor-in-Chief of Legal IT Insider. We're a global legal tech publication. Uh, we've been going, I didn't found the publication, it's been going for 25 years. Um, but I took over in 2014 as editor and also we're doing a management buyout of the business. Um, so I've got thrown into legal tech very, very deep and very quickly. Um, before that, I, so I've been a journalist, and a legal journalist for a very long time, um, since 2004. Um, and before that, I was a lawyer. I was a, latterly a, a litigator at Norton Rose, which is now obviously Norton Rose Fulbright. Um, but always, always dreamt of being a journalist <laughs> and I eventually swapped ships. Um, but I think so, I, what's been really useful, obviously as a journalist, our job is to understand, to translate, to pick up trends. And um, it's been really helpful to me to have that background where I've sort of lived it before, before Norton Rose, I did every type of law, including criminal defense. Um, which was pretty hard in South and on sea. So I had a pretty mixed career. Um, so I've seen a lot of different sides of it. Did some litigation from Gal, what's now Gowlings. Um, so it's very fun actually. Um, and I've been able to hopefully leverage that understanding of practice to, to really, um, to, to, to write. So we write about every type of legal tech there is. Um, we, and we, we write about both the back end and the front end and, and what people now think of as legal tech, which I think has changed. So we, Charles Christian, who I took over from, was writing about legal technology 25 years ago. Um, and suddenly it's become, thankfully, much more front of mind, which is a fantastic thing. Um, but I think that it's interesting to see everyone's perception of what legal technology really means um, has really changed. And I think we'll come on to some of that. And then just lastly, I think um, I echo um, what you just said um, about, uh, I, I love, being able to it, it, within the within this sector there's far too few women um, and it's great to try and help use our platform where we can to help and, and I've been a mentor with the legal geek scheme um, but I think on, honestly there's always much more like, as a, as a mum working mum who's trying to juggle a thousand things with, within COVID as well you know I think we'll maybe come to some of that I think there's always more that we can do and it's great to have a platform so thank you very much for having me to talk today Amazing, we're happy to have you. Uh, Dr. Seal, how about you next? Hi, um, good afternoon everyone. Um, thank you for uh, Fort Markets and the IBF for organizing this. I'm very excited to be part of this panel. Um, I, I, we, we had a, a sneak preview uh, last week about the great minds that are actually in this panel. And um, like um, Brian said, you, I'm sure everybody's gonna, gonna learn loads from. Um, my background is slightly different from everybody else. I, well, I started a similar career path. I'm a lawyer. Um, I, I, um, I, I graduated from the UK um, and worked as a, a lawyer in the UK, in New York, and in Jordan. And then about um, now nine years ago, I found myself in Bahrain uh, working on reform programs with the American Bar Association. Um, and that meant uh, training judges, prosecutors about um, best practice, about latest um, uh, changes in the law. Um, and then naturally, uh, when you start working on reform, uh, and I was lucky enough then to move to work as an advisor to the Chief Justice and the Minister of Justice. And on the point of women um, in Bahrain, where I, am, where I live and I have lived uh, now for the last nine years, um, you don't find many advisors that are women um, to um, senior members of the government. So I'm, I'm very proud that um, I've managed to, to, to make it to that, to that job and keeping up with the boys, really. It's, it's really what's really important. Um, it's, it's, very, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting times in Bahrain because we started around seven years ago. Actually, my boss is, the, as most people have seen, or oh, doing the opening remarks, which is the, chief, the Minister of Justice. Um, and seven years ago, we started the digitalization of the Bahraini courts. Um, and it's been a very, very, very tough, but challenging and exciting uh, times. It, I, I think it's, 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 a, it's a privilege to be part of such huge change in any organization, let alone when you're talking about the judicial system of a country. Um, and Bahrain have taken, you know, like they say, the bull by the horns and really push through this. I remember the first time I presented uh, the idea to the Minister of Justice of Digitaling Our Enforcement Courts is where we started. 
he said, can you really believe there will come a time that we will not use paper and there wouldn't be files and there wouldn't be applications? And, and I said, yeah, I really believe that's possible. You just have to believe it too. Um, and that's what we did. We managed to completely uh, digitalize our enforcement courts um, and make it completely paperless, which led to the fact that um, we were able per court to process 50 to 60 applications. Now we process 300, 350 applications per court. And we have seven, eight courts doing this business. So we churn out quite a lot of volume. The judges managed to do quite a lot of work. And it's all because we've managed to streamline the process and get them focused on making decisions relate that are judicial rather than getting stuck in paperwork and people coming in, et cetera. Um, we moved this on uh, in the very recent past, in the last three months, um, into all of our civil and commercial courts um, and family courts. Now all of the uh, cases are issued online, the fees is paid online, uh, pleadings are submitted online, the applications to the court are then online, and finally our judgments are issued online, uh, are just issued electronically. So actually we have cases starting and ending, and many have ended completely paperless. Um, as everybody that's done this kind of work can imagine, it's always very hard. Managing change, I think, for me, has been the hardest. There are people that are advocates, but obviously you have a lot of people that are resisting to change. And in an organization that's full of judges, I think that's pretty tough. Um, we've had many, many judges that loved it, but many more that really struggled to kind of see the point. And I think the biggest and the hardest challenge is to make sure and to ensure in a process like the judiciary and the courts and the, is that you're delivering justice fairly, you're giving people access to justice, you're allowing people to be presented in court and the judges to have their, um, to be able to look at all the evidence in a smooth and an efficient manner. Um, truthfully, we haven't really reached our optimum. However, we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a very good place and have started a, a journey that's very, very exciting and I'm extremely proud to be part of it. Thank you. Amazing, I think that's gonna also, that gives us a really good uh, difference in perspective here, obviously with everybody. But um, uh, Olga, why don't we, uh, why don't we uh, have you do an introduction next? Sorry, okay. Um, Christina, why don't we jump to you? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Christina Blacklaws, and I guess I've always had two parts to my career. One, which is um, about campaigning and representation, uh, and the other is I've been a lifelong innovator. So with the former part, um, I have been involved a lot of um, campaigning work over the years and latterly with the Law Society of England and Wales. And I am now the immediate past president of uh, the Law Society of England and Wales. And just one thing to highlight uh, during my time as an office holder, um, I was fortunate to be able to spearhead a piece of research and, and indeed campaigning around women in leadership in law. And uh, we undertook the largest ever global survey um, and 250 round tables in 20 jurisdictions and produced three reports out of that. And uh, maybe I'll speak about those a little bit later. The other aspect of my career has been innovation. So um, I very early on in the early 2000s set up one of the very first virtual law firms and then in 2011 in the UK with the co-op um, legal services I set up the very first alternative business structure. Um, I think I was one of the first to have a title of Director of Innovation as well. And, and that's something that I have both of these aspects I've, I've carried on with post my presidential career. So I chair and sit on a third, chair two government panels in, in the UK, which are looking at the uh, law tech. So one is the law tech uh, UK delivery panel. And the purpose of that panel is to look to inward investment and growth to scale of our law tech industry, but also to make sure that we've got 
the legislative and regulatory frameworks right. So, for example, last year we um, published a legal statement on the use of crypto assets and smart contracts uh, in the UK and in English common law. Um, and the other two ones around access to justice and innovation, perhaps we might be able to talk about that. Uh, and the, the third is around collaborative research and development in, across um, technology uh, in relation to law, accountancy and insurance. So, so collaboration has been a huge part of, um, of what I do and I think a huge part of the future success of, of, of law tech. Um, I also sit on um, a number of advisory boards and uh, I'm a non-executive director and um, global consultant for law firms and uh, legal businesses. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you, thank you, amazing. Um, okay, Olga, would you like to introduce yourself next? Well, let's give it a try. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, perfect. That's fantastic. Great. I see a lot of people shaking their heads in agreement, so this is fantastic. I'm delighted to be here. I am Olga Mack. I am the CEO of Barley Pro. CEO, uh, Barley Pro is, a, um, is an easy-to-use, highly collaborative CLM platform. We help in-house departments and procurement organizations to collaboratively manage and negotiate contracts online. Um, before I become the CEO of Parlet Pro, I was what you would describe a tech lawyer by design. I spent the majority of my career um, in, in one tech company or another. Um, initially, I was a litigator on intellectual property, security, and privacy. I spent some time at Visa, the Fortune 500 company, and then I also have been at numerous startups, either as a number two leader or as a number one general counsel. Prior to Parler Pro, I was the VP of strategy at a company called Quanta, which is an intersection of security and privacy of smart contracts. Um, throughout my career, I've, I've, thought, I've, I've talked about and written about the, uh, the future of law and digitization um, on the Above the Law, ACC, Newsweek, Bloomberg, and numerous other outlets. Um, I published a book about the security of smart contracts and in the process of publishing uh, the book about blockchain business models. It's absolutely exciting to be here. Um, I love all the women uh, on this panel doing all exciting, fantastic things that will be changing um, the future of law. And the best part of it is that it's going to be changing in our lifetime. And I strongly believe that um, we should have diverse voices. Um, in every part of, of law and leadership, um, and especially board service. So I've dedicated a big chunk of my career to also advocate for women, especially on boards. Um, I, I'm the reason why SB 826, which is a law that requires women on corporate boards in California and affecting um, how we think about leadership in the United States has passed. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to be here and look forward to hearing from everyone. Amazing. Thank you, Olga. We're happy to have you. Uh, Tenia, how about you next? Thank you, Brian. Thank you for the markets for inviting me. I'm, I'm extremely delighted to be in this panel with these wonderful uh, women and to meet some of them because hopefully I see a lot of discussion being held about mentoring, etc. So uh, we are having a mentoring scheme at the university. We'll talk about that later so I can recruit a lot of you in mentoring uh, roles. So my name is Daniel Kiryazi and I'm uh, the Head of Law and Politics and Deputy Director of Academic Operations at Middlesex University Dubai. Um, I'm obviously based in Dubai uh, for the past, so first time I came to Dubai was to visit 2005 to uh, leave in 2007 and I have been with Middlesex University Dubai since 2008 on different roles. Um, we launched uh, the first and only British qualifying law degree in the Middle East, as far as I know, face to face, uh, at Middlesex University Dubai in uh, 2014. And it has become uh, very, very popular ever since. So every year we have a larger cohort. We're very proud of our students. 
we're very uh, proud of our faculty. Middlesex University Dubai is the first overseas campus of Middlesex University in London. So we teach the same curriculum. We're accredited by the same professional bodies. Our LLPs are accredited by the same professional bodies. Obviously, I'm the least techie of all the panelists today. Um, <clears throat> but I fully understand the, the value of legal tech. And my purpose here is to be able, here and in general, to be able to expose my students, both women and men, to the challenges and the transformation of the legal profession by legal tech. So I'm keeping my eyes open, my ears open, and I'm trying to absorb all the knowledge uh, of all the, you know, the expertise that you bring into this panel. And I hope that I can invite you to the university soon because um, as soon as we are able to have face-to-face, -face, but also we can do an online uh, uh, seminar as well because th the students are very very keen to get into this field because they see it, they understand its value and unfortunately this is not fully reflected as much as we have we would have wanted in the curriculum we'll talk about that later I'm sure um, so I'm very keen uh, to have an open mind to see how my, how I can help my students to gain that exposure that's it for me for now. Yeah, it's a wonder. It's a wonderful initiative. Uh, I, really, it's amazing. I, I, I wish we had something like that at the law school when I back when I was in law school. I think it would have made it would have made 20, 20, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20 a lot easier as a lawyer. But uh, so they're lucky they have you. That's for sure. And last and certainly most not not least, Fiona. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Fort Markets. Um, I'm Fiona Kirkman, and I'm from Sydney, Australia. Not an opportune time for me at this webinar, finishing it at 1 a.m., but I'll try and stay with it. Uh, together with my techie husband, Tim, we have a legal tech startup here in Australia. I'm the legal part of the couple. I'm a specialist family lawyer and mediator, um, whereas he is a technologist. Um, our vision is really, well, my, my primary passion and vision is to empower families to resolve parenting and financial disputes efficiently and amicably. And I'm really passionate about three things. One is dispute resolution, um, utilising legal tech to uh, remove inefficiencies, and three, educating the next generation of lawyers. Uh, so my background, I was in traditional family law for over a decade. I then started my own practice Kirkman Family Law, which was focused, which is still focused on resolution without court through family mediation and collaborative practice. Um, then about three years ago, we noticed, my husband and I, that there was a lot of inefficiencies in the way things were being done in law, and there was a lot of opportunities to automate. And him having the capabilities to automate, um, we thought, thought we'd join forces, and we created our first product, Law Switch. Um, Law Switch was, or, and, and is a platform that helps automate your law firm. It has chatbots, booking pages and smart forms and as a result of when we when we launched that we actually were invited to become founding members of the Australasian Legal Tech Association and then through that association we were invited to participate in the Legal Geek uh, around the world tour and we actually won that uh, um, competition and we headed over to London for the Legal Geek Conference in 2018. And so Carolyn, I may have met you back then, I think. Um, and Cheryl and Tan, in, we visited Singapore and pre presented Law Switch at a number of conferences over in Singapore at the same time. 
Um, we were then approached by Professor Patrick Parkinson, who has an Order of Australia medal here in, in um, Australia, and he has a background in England, an international family lawyer expert, and to develop a family law product that will help with financial matters. Um, so that's been a, a passion project of mine, particularly given my background. And it's really helping not only family lawyers, but mediators and family relationship centres and other organisations with automating the admin, freeing up um, the, the lawyers and mediators to provide that valuable legal advice. Um, and lastly, I'm passionate about education. I've been involved at the Law Society, the College of Law, and some universities here teaching family law, communication skills, um, ethics, etc. I mentor a number of law students and mediation students, both formally and informally through my practice, and run a number of online groups to support women, family lawyers, family mediators, etc. So I'm really passionate about giving back to the next generation of, of lawyers. So happy to be on this panel. Thank you. We're happy to have you. And I know for sure now, I'm not the only one in, in here that's impressed by, by everybody that they're now going to listen to speak. So why don't we, um, why don't we get into it? Um, let's talk a bit about, we have a few topics today, but let's talk a little bit about um, legal tech. And I think, um, or tech in general, where, I, where I'd like to start with that is, um, I want to get the panel's views, or some of the panel's views at least, on uh, how has legal tech impacted um, the legal profession? Um, why don't we start there? So uh, let's open with Tenia. Can you, uh, can you give us a little bit of your opinion on that? How has the legal tech impacted uh, the legal profession? Well, uh, I think there is a, a very big impact, a great impact of the legal tech to the legal profession. The problem is that most lawyers don't know it or don't know it yet, or suspect it, but they're not too sure, or they know it's a big impact, but they don't know exactly what is this impact about, what is it impacting exactly. Um, so uh, what I think, because I'm, I'm with them, I still am not too sure exactly what it's impacting, so what, that's why I'm here. Um, I think it has a tremendous potential to change the legal practice, and I think we haven't seen anything yet. We're just at the very start. We're at, at the bottom of the mountain. And there's a mountain in front of us, which is the impact of legal tech to the legal profession. And we still don't know what's going to happen. And I can talk from the academic perspective. And as I said earlier, I mentioned briefly earlier, unfortunately, the law, the law curriculum in most universities, not all of them, I have to admit, a lot of them have tried to incorporate and reflect this transformation a little bit in their curriculum, but most in most universities around the world, the, the, the law curriculum is not up to date with the current trends in the legal profession in general and the impact of the legal tech in the legal profession. So you can still, if you go and look at, uh, at the module handbook in a law school, you'll find very similar contents to the one that you had when you were a student, which is very disappointing to admit, but we have to admit it and we have to be realistic. There are some good efforts that are happening, but they're quite sporadic and they're not consistent and they're fragmented, you know, here and there. So it's, it's confusing. Um, uh, so the, the curriculum of the law school does not reflect the, the transformation of the profession, does not ref reflect the impact that legal tech may have to it, and, and, and it needs, it is in urgent need of updating, but on the positive side, there are a lot of faculty members and there are a lot of practitioners who approach us and they're willing to dedicate their time to come and educate and train our students. So you'd be surprised to hear, and I, I will admit, I have no uh, problem admitting it, most of the initiatives that we have undertaken at Middlesex University Dubai that have to do with bridging um, the academia with practice 
have originated from the, from, the, from the practitioners themselves rather than from us. So they were the ones who triggered. They came to us, they wrote to us, they called call and they said, you know what, you are the only British uh, qualifying law, the, the only institution that offers this British qualifying law degree. Can we come and speak to your students? And, and that's amazing. And as you said earlier, we, don't, we didn't have that when we were students. So there are a lot of positive elements happening there, especially here in Dubai, because it's smaller and there are not that many law schools, but there are many law firms and there are many lawyers and you know, distinguished practitioners. And they also want an outlet. They want a connection with the students, with the new generation of lawyers. Um, so I think we are moving to the right direction, but in an informal and casual way, more than a formalized, consistent uh, manner. Very interesting. I, I really, I think that topic is, is, uh, is quite interesting because, I mean, well, I guess I went to law, I graduated law school now at this point quite a while ago, but uh, it seems like yesterday and it seems like all of this stuff, which is now very important to me, is was not even, it was never discussed whatsoever, not one time, when even in the earlier stages of my, of my career, but to hear that the law schools are taking the initiatives, because I admit when I was in law school, I, you don't know what's, you didn't really realize what's important, right? So you're just like, well, they tell me what to study, I study it, then you sort of get out of law school and you're like, is any of this stuff important? Every time I get asked a question, it's not what I learned in law school. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really, I think it's an, an amazing initiative that you guys are, are listening to uh, the practitioners and then, and then trying to change it because I, I, would, I would doubt that you're the only law school in the world that the practitioners are approaching, but you're probably the only one that's listening to the practitioners. So, um, <laughs> I think I think that that's probably a wonderful thing, Christina. Just on on that, um, I'm lucky enough to hold a fellowship at Manchester University, and the fellowship is sponsored by the business school, the law faculty, and the computer science faculty. And and part of this fellowship is oh. building an initiative between academia and industry, if I can put it that way, the professions. Uh, and um, I, you know, I, I completely agree with Tenia. There is so little that is going on globally in this area, um, and it's and it is a real concern because when I work in industry, um, almost all of the law firms take the view that they have to start the training of their lawyers from day one when they enter into their business because actually they haven't learned the skills. Um, that are needed for 21st or nearly the second quarter of 21st century legal practice. And, and, and that's a real failing, I think, of, of people who are paying huge amounts of money, certainly in the UK, in the US, um, to, to qualify, to get to a point where they can qualify um, as lawyers. And, and we really need to dramatically, radically rethink how we are training for law um, because we're not training for success at the moment. Yeah, I, look, I, th I think that's, I think that's a, very true. And I think, um, you know, I guess I, I don't pay attention as much to the law schools anymore being, you know, removed and rarely am I speaking to people who just graduated from law school, but um, I, you don't, you don't, I don't, I certainly don't see any of these programs or hear of any of the programs. So it's nice to hear that, that there are some out there um, and that maybe we're moving in, in the right direction slowly, but that's actually, but that's the way we know that lawyers do anything. It's just really slowly, right? Like maybe we'll get to 2020 by about maybe, I don't know, 2040 or so. Um, but um, what, um, let's open this one up to the panel um, about, uh, pain points that we see lawyers um, dealing with that legal technology is uh, either currently about to address or will address uh, in, the, in the coming years. 
I'd like, let's, why don't we hear from Sherilyn and Fiona to start on this one, because I think they're in a, in a fantastic position. I think they're paying attention to this as much, if not more than everybody else. And, and just on that previous point as well, I've heard the saying at various conferences that the lawyer of the future is going to need not only the IQ, but the EQ skills and the AI skills. And that we need to be training in those other areas just as much as the IQ, black letter law. So um, I know I'm passionate about that as well. But as far as the pain points, I'm seeing in this COVID environment, um, even though I think lawyers are slower to change than other industries, and I think, say, for online video conferencing, what probably would have taken another five to ten years, uh, we've had to adapt within a few months. And so there is change happening, and video technology is one of those things. Um, but I think... COVID has also brought about other changes and highlighted other pain points. And um, for me, what I'm seeing in the, the family law space and through the products that we're trying to address these pain points is intakes. Um, so gathering information from clients. Um, traditionally, people would come in for a face-to-face -face consultation, meet with the, the lawyer or the secretary, provide hand, hand, um, cop, hand over copies of documents, et cetera. Uh, that's not possible in this COVID environment. And so a lot of lawyers are looking for online intakes, um, whether that be through chatbots and smart, online smart forms, online booking systems, et cetera. And that's where legal tech is quite helpful in that it's able to provide that 24 seven online and automated instead of relying on a, a receptionist or a secretary to answer the calls um, or face-to-face -face conferences to gather that information. The same with document collection, disclosure, document management. Again, it's traditionally we've held on tightly to the snail mail and the, the trolleys through the the, the busy city um, taking documents to court. And I think COVID has again made a, the transformation to e-filing um, e and secure online portals and sec secure sharing of documents essential. And so again, we assist with that as if, from a family law perspective and I'm seeing a big uptake in the need to collect and disclose documents online and manage them online. And lastly, I think with what people are going through with COVID, um, le legal tasks um, and lawyers fees are becoming even more unaffordable for the general public and they're less willing to pay for those low level admin tasks that can be automated. So I think you'll see the general public really pushing for, well, if, if a, a robot can do that, why am I paying $500 or pounds um, an hour for a lawyer to be doing um, document analysis or um, reviewing and collecting documents, etc., cetera, so, um, and exchanging documents. So those things, I think, it, we should be looking at what can be automated um, and what admin tasks on that lower level can be automated so that that frees up uh, the legal profession to really focus on the valuable work, the strategic legal advice, what only a lawyer can do. And there's tasks that only a lawyer can do that technology is never going to be able to assist with. But everything else, leave to the technology in some respects. So those are some things I'm seeing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, just to add on to Fiona, I think um, you know, we're fully on board with uh, what she's mentioning as well here in Singapore. Um, one of the pain points that the legal market, not just the legal tech part, but the legal market is facing is really the, the ability for them to tap into the law firm's knowledge structure, uh, you know, really at your fingertips, right? Let's just take an example. Um, when, they want, when any lawyer wants to accept a client, right, you have to do a conflict check. Very simple thing. 
But what is currently being done in the law firms today, uh, I mean, you know, the ones who haven't adopted technology is to send out an email or, you know, uh, typing uh, into a chat or, you know, a group, um, a communications platform to say, hey, you know, I'm going to be onboarding this client. Is there any conflict, right, that we're looking at? And um, I mean, you'll be surprised that sometimes, you know, these, these um, responses take maybe one day to a week to get back. I mean, imagine onboarding a client and you need to wait for an approval uh, without being able to do conflict check immediately. That's something that can already immediately be improved, right? If you can type into your entire database and, and just do a quick search, um, the person in front of you who is, you know, dying to get uh, some legal advice uh, doesn't have to wait a week at least, right? To, to get on board it. Uh, I think that was, that was uh, something that was uh, really um, just, just things that can be improved immediately. Um, things like research, uh, it's going to really uh, improve the kind of um, uh, time that takes a lawyer to get back to the clients. So in terms of client management, uh, you're going to see huge improvements uh, where legal tech can really uh, solve uh, for some of the law firms and lawyers. Um, I think one of the key things about like how we have been onboarding technology for a lot of law firms, what we realized is, um, so the interesting thing is law firms workflow and business processes actually revolves around their current um, technology. So if you have a technology that's been built 20 years ago, they are basically working the same way as a law firm that was operating 20 years ago, right? From the way you know, documents need to be printed, uh, you know, approved by signing, uh, and then moving from one, one department to another. Uh, sometimes these processes that used to take a day or two by a secretary can e easily be done within minutes uh, on a new practice management system. So those are really, just really um, easy to improve, very quick wins um, that law firms can adopt uh, technology to do. So in terms of pain points, the lawyers are are facing, uh, I think there's really two huge parts, external factors. So what clients are really looking for today and they cannot keep up with. Of course, your client today is not going to wait a week for you to get back to them. Whilst they're waiting for you <laughs> to get back to them within the week, they would have talked to another five or 10 lawyers, right? So that's one thing uh, in terms of what clients are really uh, demanding from, from law firms these days. Second thing is within the law firm itself, uh, you see huge changes in business processes. Uh, law firms used to be managed differently with uh, just lawyers uh, at, at the helm, you know, doing both the advisory work as well as managing the firm. But you're increasingly seeing, um, you know, non-legal uh, practitioners who are, you know, who are hired to manage the firm, right? Operationally, uh, HR, uh, exactly. Building all these processes, audit uh, in place. So those are good uh, governance, right, that the law firm is adopting today. Um, and this inwards push, right, to improve those uh, processes according to today's uh, rules and regulations, as well as um, some of the improved uh, standards of uh, how you should be managing the firm. I think those will also solve the other pain parts of what the law firms are facing today, which is um, ability to react faster, ability to, you know, structure all the data points at one place, being able to churn out reports very quickly, go very granular in the way that you analyze your earnings and how you should be improving your, um, I don't know, your business uh, marketing, for example, or your, your um, cost centers. So lots that I think, um, you know, legal tech can do for the industry. Yeah, amazing. Who, um, sort of I, I actually have one point regarding this. Can when you're talking about like tech vendors, I think one of the things um, we see with a lot of those vendors is that even though when they want to serve their clients, I think that the difficulty we're seeing in the region is that the laws are not really up to date, same as those tech vendors who are trying to serve those law firms or the clients or trying to automate the processes. So you're trying to really serve them with a very um, niche product uh, who's trying to really make their life very easy. But at the same time, the moment you check how the contract needs to look like or how how this needs to be regulated, you find nothing is, is being in place. And the laws are like reading the 70s or 80s, especially in some jurisdictions as well in this region. I think that's also something that we're seeing Hopefully, it will change, but we're not seeing really change in the near future. And I will say, sorry, go ahead, Carolyn. So, I'm oh, sorry. And also, I think um, 
And yeah, you have to recognize that um, a lot of these, so, so I often talk to people about the fact that technology is the icing on the cake and a lot of these issues that you're talking about are not technology driven, they're cultural. <laughs> um, and I think that workflow, so I totally agree with Sherilyn and everything that you said pretty much resonated with the points that I made. It all comes down to workflow process um, and that, that, that goes to the back end and the front end. So we've seen, you know, sort of improvements in the way that we, we, we that, that people are um, solving the pain points in, in terms of increasing efficiency and their support functions. Um, we're already seeing some improvements with technology and sort of making that more um, process driven um, and within the contract management space, we're starting to see things becoming much more automated. I think that we're gonna see links between the whole lot. We're gonna see much more improved workflow so that it becomes much more seamless, but, I think that the issues, um, aside from regulatory or, or vendor driven, I think are within the law firms and, and the, um, the provider themselves in that they have to recognize that what they do is a process and that what they, they have to recognize that what they do can be automated. Um, so I think that that's that, that before you start talking, I mean, we're here to talk about tech, so this is perhaps a little bit of an aside, but I think that um, that you have to kind of dig deep. Um, and then and work out what your processes and, and are, are and what your workflow is and then work out how to automate it um, and then you'll come up with something sensible. <laughs> Can I add I, I, that, um, that uh, I, I think that's absolutely right. You know, there is a reason why we call it people process tech. You know, it comes in, in, in that order. But I just wanted to pick up on, on Yoss's um, regulatory point or legislative point, I think, which is uh, from a policy perspective, I think is really, really important. You, we have to have the right policies um, and, and the right regulatory support in place to enable um, entrepreneurialism and, and law tech to, to flourish. Um, and, and for me, um, from the work that I do, the pain points that I see are at, 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 a, at a sort of meta level are around things like uh, the lack of common data standards, um, the lack of ability for responsible data sharing, the, the lack of interoperability between different platforms, because of what we have is a, a lot of sort of point solutions um, in, in law tech. Um, whereas um, they, they need to be able to work together really well, they need to be able to speak to each other. And, um, and, and that, that platformization is something that is, is rare at the, at the moment. So, um, so, so those, I think, for me, are, are at a policy level, are really key in terms of the pain points. Thanks. You think, Christina, do you think that we'll see the integration happen naturally or this will you think maybe this will be a result of like M&A starting to happen within the, the legal tech sphere where maybe some of the, the larger ones start to acquire and then they, they integrate them? And we, we've seen a lot of that already, Brian. So, um, you know, some of the great startups have been snapped up by, by the big tech platforms. Um, some, of, some startups have now scaled up and are looking at, at, at the very least, at joint venturing with, with, with others. So you've got the rain court type approach. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot out there which is looking to establish that, um, that world, that opportunity for the technology to work seamlessly together. And if you look at it from a, a, a client or customer um, perspective, then it has to be. There has to be that seamless customer journey and that customer might be the lawyer it might be an end customer, but you know, for whatever it needs, it needs to move in, in that direction. I think if it's going to become embedded and ubiquitous in terms of practice. Yeah, uh, agreed. I think that's uh, from an in-house perspective, that becomes my biggest challenge in acquiring legal technology is the business wants to know one of the questions, is it scalable? You know, so I've seen really, I've only used a lot of the bigger solutions because they can integrate with what we already have. Um, you know, things like using uh, NetSuite, Salesforce, DocuSign, Conga, stuff like that. They're so large that their APIs are going to integrate with other stuff. And when you start 
investigating smaller platforms they're like well you know we're working on the apis or what have you and it's like well you know it's going to be really hard for me to get a budget for this so i think that i think that's an an excellent point um that productization at scale you know that's that's where we're going to see it move i think from the artisanal to the industrial yeah that's really interesting um who, this to, to to the group. Who do we um, kind of piggybacking on top of on this topic is who is who's dri who's driving this change? Is it um, is it clients? Is it the legal tech companies? Is it law firms? Is it in house counsel? I've I think I've I've heard the argument. I think for just about any one of them, um, but I'd be really interesting because you guys are so so involved in this sphere and or are one of, uh, fit into one of these four categories. I think I'd like to hear your opinion on this. Maybe I can talk a little bit. Um, I, um, this is a very interesting discussion um, and I'll address a couple of questions. One is that um, with respect to um, uh, when, when did it start and, and when will it actually snowball? Um, it started a while ago, um, uh, and I remember graduating from law school 15 years ago in the United States, and e-discovery rules just uh, were addressed, um, and uh, I, as a young associate, was implementing it on my cases. Um, but what, and, and so we've, I've seen changes every year in every organization I've been part of, from big law firm to a Fortune 500 company to numerous startups. Um, but what's very interesting today is how much of it is snowballing, um, partially because the technology is, is, is really right. Uh, the capabilities are, are very unprecedented, and we can do a whole lot of interesting things that we're not able to do before. The circumstances are definitely very interesting. COVID uh, has put quite a lot of uh, pressure on many organizations. Um, and, uh, and force uh, to embrace digitization and online collaboration and all other tools that have been available to other functions as well. So I do think that we're going to see a lot of transformation in our lifetime, in fact, in the next five, 10 years. And I do think that now is a very interesting time and there is a, a snowballing effect that is going on. Um, with respect to um, who leads this? That's a very interesting question because I do think that uh, it is an ecosystem. It takes different actors uh, to combine its efforts and the sum of the individuals is much greater than individual effort. Um, I am a little biased uh, toward in-house lawyers partially because I've spent majority of my career in-house and uh, I've definitely felt pressure to innovate and, and to do uh, keep up with the business. Um, In-house, you have quite a lot of things. To, for example, um, you have um, changing expectations uh, and pressures to provide real-time legal advice and to not be um, signing contracts on paper, for example. Uh, that pressure existed for a long time. Uh, you also see other peers in other functions using tools that are modern um, and able to achieve a whole lot more. And you sort of wonder as an in-house lawyer, how come I'm building a, 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 a building with a spoon? Uh, and while it's not impossible, it's just really, really hard and it's really, really frustrating and it doesn't look good in the end. Um, and then of course you have sort of the proverbial doing more with less. So you have, as an in-house, you definitely have a lot of pressures and a lot of opportunities. And so, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that in-house leads it, but in-house is absolutely a key, key stakeholder that drives it and, and fuels it. And, um, and, 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 and a lot of the innovation does happen in-house. Um, and maybe the last thing I would like to address is about um, integration um, and, um, and building bridges. What we do as lawyers, especially as a former in-house lawyers, is building bridges. We're usually at the center of the organization. Uh, we usually talk to everyone. Uh, we know quite a lot that is going on, and it only makes sense that our technology staff uh, also talks to everyone. 
because we support the business to thrive and grow. And there's absolutely no way we can do that unless we build bridges in our communication and unless we actually build bridges in our technology. Wonderful. Um, how how does the group think that? Uh, Sorry, Brian. Sorry, can I can I can I make as you didn't add um, um, the 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 courts and the and the you know the judiciary part of your choices? Um, I feel a bit obliged <laughs> to say something. Please feel free. <laughs> um, for us, actually, it, it's uh, it's uh, it's just interesting in Bahrain. Really, when we started this whole process with the enforcement courts, it was really driven actually by necessity, I think. Necessity for efficiency, a necessity for cost effectiveness, the necessity to deal with the number of cases coming in, and obviously the demands of time that you cannot really take. It, it certainly cannot take you know, uh, uh, months and years on end before you actually resolve disputes for people, um, especially when you're focusing on commercial or more, um, uh, and actually I think even in the most civil basic cases, people are so used to instant responses now everywhere. They expect that from their courts as well as any business. So there was a demand I think by our users, which are the, the, the people, a lot less, a lot more than the lawyers to be frank, um, to actually have a more efficient, a more effective, faster uh, legal system, a, more, a, 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 a core process. And based on that demand really by, by the people, um, we, we had no choice but to deliver a, you know, a more efficient system. And there was no other way of doing it except digitalization. So I think we driven in Bahrain quite a lot of that process. Um, and there was a lot of um, resistance really from, from the legal profession, a lot. And they, I wanna see the judge. I don't wanna write, you know, I don't wanna use the online system. I want to see the judge. And so in that sense, um, we've, we've, we've really battled uh, in, in Bahrain with, with the profession. And as somebody pointed out, COVID is, is, is a godsend in a lot of ways because all of a sudden, instantly, the legal profession was demanding digitalization in a more and more courts because obviously because of the situation in COVID, you, you wanted to, as we all um, needed to, by choice because in Bahrain, we didn't have a lockdown. By choice, the lawyers didn't want to come to court and they didn't want to present their cases, and they wanted to, but they wanted the process to continue. And therefore, we were able to deliver justice during COVID um, through digitalization and by allowing people to submit documents online. Now, what would be interesting, and I'd, I'd love to have this conversation with you guys in a couple of years' time and see, will the lawyers demand going back? Will they say, I want to see the judge? I don't want to send him things written down on a piece of paper. Um, I think that that for us has been a very interesting a driving force um, is that the, 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 the administration of justice uh, between the Chief Justice and the Minister of Justice and their, and their team have driven really the whole issue of digitalization. Um, and I, I, I'm hoping, I spoke to many lawyers recently, and I think now they understand the value of being comfortably sitting in your office and being able to make applications instead of be stuck in a queue um, for for a couple of hours because you're, try you're trying to do something that's pretty straightforward. So I think in that sense, um, in some situations, like we found in Bahrain, the administrative, the administration of the courts and administration of justice can ha has a huge role to play, to push change and to demand it um, and to encourage it where, uh, where, where, where possible. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. That's interesting. The one thing that I um, admittedly don't know a lot about, but I'm very intrigued by is how legal technology and digitalization is uh, going to increase uh, access to justice. Uh, you know, I've, I've, obviously, I've read a lot about this. Uh, I know China is making a really big push in this area, but obviously there are other countries as well. Um, I think, Isil, I think you're, you're a great person to maybe speak on that a bit. And I know it takes you, there's a couple members of the panel here who have um, some experience in that realm. I think, uh, let's hear a little bit about that. Um, absolutely. And, and I think that's one of, one of the most important um, uh, values or, or product of this digitalization, especially in a time when, frankly, all law 
I used to be in private practice. So, but now we're talking from the outside, you know, legal fees are expensive. Um, and it, it's, it's sometimes very unaffordable for many people. Um, that, that, that actually causes two problems. If you're in the court system, have many delays, then it's going to cost a lot more for people to go to court um, because if they, you know, lawyers are charging them for the time they, they are running their cases. So it's a very important to be able to resolve cases quickly. But also at the same time, if you created a, a, a system that is simple enough, then people might be able to do quite a lot of the legal work on their own, um, which we find in the enforcement court. Um, uh, when we first started, um, the percentage of people um, that actually um, pursued their own, and, and I mean enforcement of the court is enforcing judgments, civil judgments. Um, it, nobody, it, very few people have took it, you know, felt brave enough to come to court and sort this out. And as the online process came, came on, um, we now almost have 50-50, 50% lawyers and 50% um, individuals, you know, because it's a really simple system. You ask the judge of what you want, you write a few words, it doesn't need to be legal, and judges are very open to this, they're very understanding, um, and, and it's made a huge difference for people to be able to access justice. And in, in my mind, I think one of the greatest things we've achieved is, is the ability of allowing people to access justice wherever they are. Um, especially uh, you know hopefully you guys will visit us once in bahrain but we our, our courts are in in the middle of the city it takes you an hour and a half to find parking it, it's 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 a nightmare to come to court honestly um and if you are as an individual trying to access justice in the most basic of sense um you're expected to kind of i don't know find parking 6 a.m so it's it, in that sense, in the most basics of sense, having this online digitalized system, and we're hoping working now towards virtual hearings where you can attend hearings um, virtually, which is something we're, we're trying out. We haven't really, um, we haven't achieved it yet, but we, it's something we are, we're testing at the moment. Will make a huge difference for people. Um, and the more things you streamline the, and the faster you do things, hopefully you also will be able to make that up in legal fees uh, for many people. Can I talk a little bit about uh, a few trends that I see? Uh, one is that we uh, have, uh, as a society, for a long time have accepted a very dysfunctional relationship with law. Uh, we think it's, so, it's okay not to know what the law applies. It's okay to sign contracts. We don't know what's in them. Uh, we think it's absolutely fine for law not to serve its citizens. What technology enables you is, is, is for law to actually be of service and be helpful and to be helpful when you need it. And I think solving this problem is very exciting. Um, it is amazing when you talk to uh, business, um, how many of them, um, it always blew by lawyer um, didn't know that uh, for various functions they do, they have a number of contracts that apply and govern what's going on. And then when they do the contract, uh, they, they certainly have no idea what's in it. Um, and, and interestingly enough, for example, people like contracts have many business terms. They have legal terms, but they also have business terms. And uh, it is amazing how, how much much we accept um, that that law is not here to serve us, um, and that is a change in reality. And that is what I would like to see. Uh, what the speaker just alluded before me is another trend: the platform uh, that government is increasingly uh, serving its citizens. Um, and uh, you know, while the courts have not necessarily situation or future of law. What, what courts, courts actually doing uh, online hearings, embracing technology to most people, uh, a stamp of approval. Uh, because we, we inherently in many countries and hopefully all countries respect courts. And um, if courts are doing things, uh, because we do like to believe that justice is impartial, uh, we want to keep that we the uh, behavior. And so um, seeing during COVID uh, judges uh, in black robe um, 
inviting lawyers to participate in hearings online. Um, asking lawyers to use various uh, video conferences for discussion. Uh, it legitimizes uh, technology. It legitimizes that the law is here to serve you. Um, and I think that they, the, the court system may not have started this, but it is most certainly snowballing and making it uh, acceptable. And I think that's why we're going to see a lot of effects um, in the next five to 10 years. And if I can just jump in very quickly, Brian, I think COVID has done us, like there's not many great things you can say about COVID, but within the context of the courts, one of the things it has done is shown us what's possible in a short period of time. I think that what, what, what there was obviously progress being made in terms of moving online, digitizing processes, but actually there were some, some of them are many years away and what COVID has done is accelerated those dramatically and shown us what can be done within a really short space of time, given the impetus. So I think actually in that sense, that's been something that has been a very positive change and something that has been quite surprising to those people who've been involved in it for a long time. Um, and the amount of court of, you know, we, we had court of appeal judges who redrafted protocols in 14 days that would have taken years. So I think that actually um, we've seen really, you know, the, kind of what, what's possible recently. Can I yeah. say access to justice is, it, the way I define it, it's much, it, it's not, it doesn't correlate with necessarily with access to a lawyer or indeed access to a court. And um, you know, um, there's been a recent survey, certainly in the UK, where two thirds of the people surveyed so that the court says, you know, none of this is set up for, for them. And I think that what we can look to, what's really exciting about innovation in, um, in terms of access to justice is that we can look at it being entirely disruptive and about being um, you know, customer centric and about empowerment of the citizenry um, and, and doing things in a way that everybody wants. And whether I speak to individuals or to businesses, small business to huge business, they all want their issues that they have resolved with certainty, speed, and cheaply. Yeah, and, and that 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 is what that's yeah, I certainly I can only talk really about the UK courts, but that is not something that are characteristics you would immediately spring to mind when describing um, our processes here. So so to be able to to rethink done some really interesting reading um, around crowdsourced um, decision making um, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, and I think that we can we can look to be really creative in, in this area and come up with solutions that that actually meet people's needs um, rather than set, starting with we have these institutions and and it is the institution which needs to um, to prevail. Um, and where, where, uh, where does the group think in the next three to five years we'll see technology in the legal field going? Um, uh, in whether it's for the courts, whether it's for law firms, whether it's for um, in-house counsel, whether it's for education. Um, how do we how do we think legal you know le it could apply to where do we think legal tech will change uh, how lawyers are educated in the next three to five years? Well, I can start from education. If, if that's okay, and I can tell you that similarly to legal tech, we also saw the same the same thing with edutech. So with COVID, as you said, I was on another panel recently and someone said, and he was very right, you know, we have to thank COVID for giving us access to more students, giving more students access to us, to more material, um, uh, to, 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 to more effective learning. So I think that now one of the skills that we are training our students is at is to build those skills to be able to use technology in their lives in general. And that, if, if you take that into the law student's body, then the, those law students will be able, going to a job later, to carry over those skills 
and be keen to be introduced and be integrated into the legal tech transformation. So in that respect, I think that education and through COVID and through everything that we've been through uh, during the past three months, we've transformed, it has transformed education and it has transformed the way students see us and the way students see their future. And we have even seen now students doing um, virtual internships. A lot of law firms are offering virtual internships. So I see my students, they post on LinkedIn how they have completed a virtual internship in this firm and that firm. And I'm extremely proud because this would never have happened before. So they can have access to more internships now. We have been telling them if this is our uncertain times and you know you will struggle to get placements and you will struggle to get internships. And we see them despite all odds that they are able to get even more internships now that they were before. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of approach as well. It's how, how keen you are, how open-minded you are and uh, to, to, to grab the opportunity or to, 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 to see an adversity and turn it into an opportunity. That's an amazing skill. Personally, as an in-house lawyer, um, it, it's it's difficult um, to like we we are normally the line of business who are a cost center rather than the revenue generator. So it's really difficult for a com like to really build a business case to ensure that the company provides us with the budget to actually invest in legal tech. However, personally, seeing the past couple of years when we invested in, in a system as contract management, where the company in the beginning thought that. This is a huge cost why we're investing in something like this. We have a, such a huge department. Showing the value of the legal department and how it's helping us making more, I wouldn't say work more, but working efficiently, documenting what we're actually doing. So it's more of helping us do our jobs and effectively do more or see where the gaps are and start like analyzing where are our gaps to ensure we're addressing that. So for instance, we started with a contract management system. Now we have a contract automation system. And the third one was compliance and like risk, um, third party risk management. Um, so it's, it's more of really seeing the gap. It's helping us as in-house lawyers, really seeing the gaps we do in our jobs and really also show value to the company and what we're doing, uh, where I think in my opinion, what I'm seeing in the market is lawyers are generally um, resistant to change. They're very human centric. They feel that what they're doing is their intellect, which is part, part of it is true. And that's why there a lot of them are against change, against using technology. But I think once you start using that, you feel it's really helping you do your job more efficiently. and really do better, like be better at what you do rather than just replace you. And that's, I think, the fear that a lot of lawyers are having is like they fear that tech is going to replace them as lawyers. And I've heard that with, from a lot of in-house lawyers in our, re like um, talking to them in person, but I feel it's really helping us do our jobs efficiently rather than just really replace us as lawyers because you can't have a robot giving advice to a person, but it's rather making sure you're giving, instead of, doing one contract in one day, it's being able to do 30 contracts in one day and um, and not doing the same job, admin job, um, every day, I guess. Um, it's, but it's also about linking both sides, I think. So it's about, you're obviously speaking from the in-house perspective, then you have private practice who talk about their technology. I think going forward, one of the, one of the with things, the way they are starting to go, and, and I think with the direction of travel, it will be about helping to link the two. I think right now, it's almost, there's almost an adversarial role between private practice and in-house, and, and I think some of the technology that we're starting to see emerge, looking at that and saying, right, how can we help to make that a cohesive thing, right? You're rather than you're talking about your technology, they're talking about their technology, there's a big gap in the middle that's inefficient. I think that in, in the future, that, that is something which we're already starting to see some progress, but it's very early days. I think that making it a whole, right? So that you you aren't sort of, there's not a gap between when you sense, you know, everybody's trying to work out, well, where's this? And what, you know, I think make, drawing the whole thing together to make it efficient. Christina talked about platformization. We've talked about, you know, the, 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 the thing is gonna be about integration, platformization, making it a cohesive offering, rather than at the moment, all these bitty inefficient point solutions, both from 
within the law firm or the, the, the legal organization and the client, I think it will be about pulling it all together. Barbara, um, did you, uh, did you oh, want sorry. to? Oh, sorry. Barbara, did you want to add something? Um, yes, hi. Um, so I think in response to the where will we be in three to four years' time, um, I think of this through the lens really of change agency in terms of thinking of all the different stakeholders, the different players that are, are moving around the legal sector in whatever form they, they are and how it, it's, it's really about empowering people to imagine the service provision that they could give or receive in that three to five year time frame because what we often find in the absence of compelling um, world events such as COVID is that in the absence of a burning platform, in the absence of COVID, um, getting people to get their head out of the weeds and think that much further ahead is, is a massive challenge. So I think in terms of, you know, where will the technology that enables what we do evolve, it will evolve in line with the businesses or users' willingness to think ahead to see how the power of decision makers change and decision makers evolve. So in the private sector, I think Caroline put a note on to say the rise of the legal operations um, kind of cohort within in-house. I, I was a director of legal operations 16 years ago, way before it was fashionable to, to do that. Um, but it was about thinking about efficiencies. But actually what the driver for me was, wasn't actually the internal efficiencies. It was we had spent money in the market to acquire clients. Every time we didn't behave efficiently, we lost business. And it, it started to be, to solve that problem, we had to think of, of ourselves as the user. Um, we were onboarding 15,000 clients a month. You know, that, that requires you to scale up and, and behave in in slightly different ways. The power of the decision making, the procurement systems, the people who are making finance decisions, all of these things are evolving over time. Um, so I think for me that, you know, where, where that change is coming from is really being able to recognize the power of these different change agents to influence really positive and powerful outcomes. Um, so I'll stop myself because otherwise I'd just go on. <laughs> I think I think he I think he certainly got the agreement of the group on that one. Um, um, why don't we, I, I, go ahead, go ahead I, uh, to be honest, where, where I work, this is a very controversial statement to make, but you know, I just I feel there are such simple cases that judges spend a lot of time turning. Really, basic simple cases. You know, I owe person X um, amount of money, for example. It's a really simple case. Um, and I don't know if there is, you know, I've, I've, from my research, there, there is, seems to be some sort of possibility where technology will be able to deal with these very minor disputes um, without, or with minimal, let's say, human intervention. I, I, I remember having this discussion with, with a few judges once and said, do you want to replace us with robots? Do you honestly think that would be possible? And, and I don't know if, it, if it, you know, I, I can't imagine, like, like lawyers, they will not be replaced by machine, for sure. There is a lot of... Um, uh, skill in, in, in the legal work uh, that is necessary. But like every made the point, there is a lot of administrative um, work that's done by judges. That's quite, um, that, that I, I believe that technology can actually um, take over and make, make very efficient. Um, I think for the challenge, um, and this is something we, we discuss all the time is, what happens to court staff? Because a lot of the work at the moment that goes on in our courts has been in a way moved on to judges because you know the usual administrative stuff is done by technology. So less and less use of, uh, of court staff. And, and I think that would be, be a, that's an issue or a challenge or a fear in many, in, in many industries and in particularly in, in the law industry that you have, at least in Bahrain, you have hundreds of thousands of, 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 of uh, graduates law graduates and then what do you do with them you know it's it's been usual that they incorporated into these um into the court system which which includes a lot of people employs a lot of people in into law firms into um government uh departments etc and it becomes a, the very interesting task is what would the lawyers do and i think that brings a full cycle to the point that the education have to really change 
because otherwise we're going to graduate people that are completely redundant. Um, and a lot of the work they will do in the court, and I'm not talking about judges, uh, but even judges, but even behind the judges, judges' clerks, judges' court staff, um, a lot of the stuff now what we have in our courts, they used to do, they don't do them anymore because technology has, has taken over and, and, and they've done them. And I can see that in the next three to five years, our court system, at least in Bahrain, will look very, very different. It will be very efficient and there'll be minimal um, intervention uh, into the process by anybody beside the judge. And I'm hoping, and I don't know if it's would happen in five years, that certain judgments could possibly be issued by, um, by, 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 by AI, you know, by, by technology. But please don't repeat me saying that because I think I might lose my job. <laughs> well, um, can I just add a bit uh, of uh, perspective here from the tech uh, side? Please. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, it's great to hear all of you and, and, you know, the perspectives from, you know, whether it's an in-house counsel or from law firm, from, from faculty, from the justice uh, and the courts, right? Uh, I think in the next three to five years, it's going to be very exciting for all legal pro practitioners and everyone who works uh, in the legal industry, uh, mainly for a few reasons. 80% um, of the road data entry work is going to be replaced. I mean, that, that, that's, um, that's what we think is going to happen. And the few main reasons are um, actually quite uh, positive. So, of course, now with COVID, you have, um, you know, I, I think um, the, the court system trying to go towards more digital filing. The government are also trying to encourage uh, digital filing of documents as well as um, legal processes. Schools are push, pushing for the use of legal tech. Um, I think in Singapore and a couple of uh, universities around, uh, you have legal tech as part of the uh, course. And not just legal tech, but also business management courses, right, that helps uh, a legal professional to graduate from school, not just knowing how to practice law, but how to run a law firm. Um, so that would be very exciting. Um, you have younger lawyers who don't want to do the same things as, you know, their, their predecessors did anymore. Like they, they look at them and, you know, of course, the whole idea of like having work-life balance or having the option to have work-life balance, you know, like the option not to have to jump into a big uh, firm and to, to basically work really long hours uh, to qualify for partnership. Um, there are options these days for uh, law to be practiced differently. Uh, I think in Australia, I mean, I've, I've uh, spoken to Fiona about this when I was in Australia where um, there's so many alternative law firms coming up, right? There are people who can run their law firms just with, a, with an account uh, and just being online and you can, you can basically do advisory online. But one of the interesting things coming from the tech perspective really is the fact that software is going to be so much more affordable. I think what we see in the market is in the last 20 years, all the big chunky software that law firms have been using that are really expensive is now going to be so affordable. And more than ever, I mean, these days, there's so many free trials for all these, docu uh, for all these um, software that, you know, legal professionals can just get themselves um, you know, dirty and trying all these, um, you know, hands-on stuff on, on, on technology, which previously you, you aren't able to, because before this, um, software used to be big, chunky, and to implement it is like, either I go or I don't. There's no halfway or there's no trying period, but now software is made so available that, you know, you can basically try anything. Uh, you just go online and, you know, search for uh, solutions for the legal, uh, legal industry, and you can you know, just get a free account and try. And that is the part that's exciting because I'm excited to see how uh, legal professionals can become more um, savvy, right? And to, to be more opinionated about the, the kind of tech that they use uh, because now they don't know what they don't know. <laughs> so it's like a, you know, a place where, you know, they just appeared in, in this uh, blank canvas and, and everything is out there for them to try. So uh, I think it's gonna be exciting. Um, and I think that because of technology, also more people will be served and more people will want to go to lawyers. Um, so for Asia Law Network, one of the things that we've discovered in doing a lot of um, uh, uh, surveys and, and getting to know clients is that um, people are afraid of going to lawyers. I mean, basically because it's so difficult to, number one, get a booking with a lawyer to get uh, you know, a, an appointment. Second thing is they don't know how much lawyers cost. 
that because everything is, um, I mean, more transparent online, uh, you have, you know, pre-engagements, like having conversations with lawyers, uh, lawyers are actually more uh, accessible. They're more, they're closer to you, right, than you, uh, lawyers used to be. So more people will feel comfortable with lawyers, just like how you would go to a GP, right? You go to a GP where you have a cough or the same flu that you had and you know the doctor is going to give you the same thing. Um, we expect that to see, uh, you know, in the legal industry where, you know, for small things, you want to go to a lawyer because that's whom you want to trust. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for improvement in the industry and there's a lot of market uh, that need to be served. So very exciting time. Thank you. Agreed. Fiona, go ahead. And, and I would agree with what Cheryl has said around the importance of the legal profession getting into the sandbox and trying the technology. Uh, I, I think, yes, in in an ideal world, everything's integrated. But as Sherilyn said, a lot of technologies that are solving particular pain points and whilst it might not be completely integrated, if it can help with one particular inefficiency that, that helps the client, um, I think that's a good thing. And you'll see from a legal tech startup perspective, it is sometimes difficult um, to compete with the big players and to have a full integration with all the practice management systems, et cetera. So it is, it is important that the, the smaller players can provide perhaps more innovative solutions um, because they're quite agile and flexible, et cetera. Um, but I think there's that fear still of lawyers. Uh, I know with our chatbots, there, there was a fear, oh, are lawyers taking over our, our jobs, as Yossa said. Um, there is that fear there. And I think there's a fear that they'll take away our, our legal costs as well. We've had clients that have said, oh, well, what you can do at a few clicks of a button when it comes to document collection and disclosure and, and analysis, that is something that we can charge five to $10,000 for. Uh, and my response is, well, should you be charging that? And are, uh, is the general public going to accept that in the future if that task, particular task can be automated? So I think um, the focus at the moment has really been on helping lawyers um, be more efficient, but that hasn't necessarily um, flo flowed through to providing more cost-effective access to justice to the general public. And my hope that in the next three to five years, that will change. More of the legal tech products will be not just B2B products, but B2C, where we can really provide that access to justice and provide self-service options that I think Dr. Asil has talked about as well, where we simplify the, the law and provide direct access to the general public. So that's what we're hoping to do in with our products as well. Great. Um, the what I'd like to um, head kind of move over to the to another topic, um, which is the uh, I want to get your opinions on um, women in tech, women in legal, around tech, around around legal. Um, uh, because to me, this is one. I think this is one. While while the talking about the technology and the legal is is really interesting, I find this topic very interesting as well. I'd like to get your opinions on now that we're in 2020. Um, are there are are there still barriers to women to to enter law and to enter uh, tech um, as as people may you know, might stereotypically think, or has it changed in uh, if it's changed, how has it changed? Can I talk about the research that um, that, that we did at the Law Society? Because Please, yeah. I'm, I'm afraid the answer to the question is a resounding yes. Um, there are still um, what I would term systemic barriers to the advancement of women and you can um, replace women with any protected characteristic actually and just to finish that point where um, where there is intersectionality so so where your female 
and disabled or female and um, black and minority ethnic heritage. Uh, for example, um, you, you know, what we found was that the barriers uh, just increase exponentially. Um, and, and it is so, it, it, the, the main barrier we found was around, around bias. Um, some of this was um, very overt bias. Um, and and this, is, this is a piece of global research. Um, some of it was much more unconscious, um, but all of it was around the, the social and cultural expectations of what women should do and how they should uh, behave. And, um, and the assumptions and the impact of those assumptions on um, women's um, ability to and desire indeed to progress their their careers. Um, the other thing that we found with law, and I think it's very true of tech, is that it it is very male shaped. So everything that is um, a, around um, progression and engagement with clients and business development is 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 very male orientated um, and. To go back to uh, something that was said right at the outset um, by a number of, of panelists, that the lack of representation at senior levels of, of women um, really does resonate down the, the, the pipeline. So, so women who, who don't see people like them in positions of um, authority within their business don't really sort of in, in a sense, see or feel that they have senior leadership potential. So we don't have, in, and I can, in terms of the stats in the UK, for the last 15 years, the new entrants into the profession of law have been two thirds female. So we don't have any problem with women coming in. Um, where we do have the problem is with women getting to those, those senior positions. Um, so, so, so I would, I would say yes, we do have a problem. Still. And, and in legal tech, there have been so perhaps not to the extent that you've done, Christina, but there have been a few studies. So Dana Dennis Smith from Obelisk has done some studies within legal tech specifically, um, and it makes for really poor, poor reading. If you if you look at Crunchbase and you look at the number of um, legal tech companies, for example, um, and, you, and then you look at the number that were founded by women, um, the, the stats are, I can, I can post actually a couple of links on the, on the um, chat function that might be helpful to people, but um, so Dana found that um, she looked at 10 years of data, she identified three and a half thousand US and UK businesses in new law. Um, of the companies, she found 265 had um, at least one woman founder, 67 had sole woman founder, um, actually, I won't read through it, but, but basically it's, it's, it's paltry. So of the 10 largest fundraisers, um, having raised a total of 1.8 billion, none had a sole woman founder. This is probably the more relevant bit, sorry. Um, and, and, and the stats are just really poor. So there's, there's an issue and, and, and they found there are various issues um, and, and that, that bias that Christina was talking about was one. So some of the questions that they were asked by, um, by, the, by, by potential investors were, uh, are you the cupcake or the kid thing on the agenda? Why don't, why don't you do this as a hobby? Can you add a male person to the management team? Have you had your eggs frozen? And then <laughs> it just goes on. It's just utterly depressing. These are real questions that, were, that have been asked. It's a huge issue. Um, and, um, and then there's another piece by Bloomberg. Um, that looked at 73 of the 769 companies tagged as legal tech in crunch base as a female founder, that's just 9.5%. Um, the stats are really miserable, to be honest with you. It's a huge issue. And then you see that within the CIOs. I mean, I'll, I'll shut up now and let somebody else speak. But so within, um, I had a look at some of the, um, the CIO stats within, you know, so, so within, within, what's really interesting is within the mainstream sector, the stats are actually apparently going up. So the number of female CIOs is on the rise, according to an article last year, which said that an estimated 18% of CIOs are, are women, which is up from 16% in 2017. I think within the legal, I've not actually, I need to do this, but I think within the legal tech sector, that I, it's dropping as far as I can tell. Um, and I need to do some official research really, but from, from my own anecdotal evidence, it's getting worse, not better. What is even more disappointing, if I may, is that I, 
you see at, at the law school level, most of the students that study law, at least from my own observations are girls, and they tend to do better. So if, if you look at it globally, this is a global yeah. observation that girl law students tend to do, tend to graduate with better degrees. So we have a big proportion that enters the profession. And then of course, for the reasons that uh, you mentioned, the whole thing think, gets compressed. I think it. there's a lot of um, aspects around this in, um, Part of it you, you guys discussed, I think, for instance, when I personally email clients saying that these are my comments to the contract, the instant response I get, for instance, from clients, especially in government sectors, that they assume I'm a male. So, dear Mr. Hamza, and that's the, like, that's the perception I get. So, there, there is one, there is the cultural and perception that this is a male-oriented, um, I would say, a job. And therefore, the, the automatic response usually comes is that the one I'm talking to is a male. And therefore, unless I go talk to the phone, he knows I'm a female, he wouldn't know. I think the second part of it, as you said, is the personally, when I was in law, like law school, and that was like probably a decade ago, um, all the top students on the class, um, the one who really managed to do very well were females. However, when they went off the job market, all the ones who were like really targeted are male. Like um, personally, when I like I when when I personally graduated, I thought like I would never be hired in a law firm because when I go to see the market, all the like ninety percent of the market are males. I was like, how I'm going to really penetrate the market? It's like I know I'm really well. I know what I'm doing. I know that I'm really a successful person, but how I'm going to penetrate the market, as Christina said, is the lack of representation of female role models across the market in the legal sector, whether in-house or private practice. I think one of the third things that um, law firms and companies do have policies regarding work-life balance, but you know, these are rarely implemented and females are really afraid um, to go and say like, well, I, like, when you, I, I'm not sure, but that's how I see it like in practice is that females are usually afraid to say like, well, I can't do this task, for example, at the moment, I have like a personal errand that I need to do. Well, it's very fine for a male peer to say like, well, um, uh, that's fine. And my, my, my day has ended. Um, these are my working hours. I will never respond to an email um, after six, for instance, but a female would never be able to do that. I would say she's fearing that she's going to be judged that because she's a female. The policies are never implemented. So when I go to my female peers in law firms, they're afraid to, for instance, to go and say to take their PDOs or they're afraid to, um, I would say, have families. Um, they're, they're really afraid. They think that if she has a family, she will lose her progression or she's going to lose her um, career progression or opportunity to become a partner or a senior counsel in the firm she's working with. Um, one final thing I have is the policies across the market or the laws um, in each region. I think multinational companies do have an obligation to take policies or I would say laws um, from jurisdictions that have really strong um, maternity or paternity leave, such as the UK or Germany, and start implementing something similar in jurisdictions as the Middle East. It's ridiculous to find at this age, um, at this era, in the 21st century, where a company or a, a country that is giving a woman only 40 days post her maternity leave to return to work, absolutely ridiculous. I mean, of course, she will either resign or she'll have to think, rethink about her career progression because she thinks that I really have to um, give up one of them. It's either my career or I raise a proper child where I can be with my child at home. Um, I think companies also have, um, especially the bigger ones, have um, a really big role in um, encouraging females having that kind of flexibility to, to if, if she can't have a PDO, then you're offered to work remotely. I mean, lawyers don't really have to be at the office all day. Um, as long as you have your laptop, you're probably going to be able to work and manage your, your work. But um, you rarely find that kind of flexibility offered in practice, although they're like found in, in, in policies. Like personally, I, we have them in Gartner. 
um, in practice, you rarely find a manager who actually implement that. And if, when you have a, that kind of manager, you're really like, um, I would say saluting that you, you really feel so lucky that you're having someone who supports the kind of flexibility offered. Um, and given that lack of work-life balance or females who are finding that kind of lack of work-life balance, they also feel that they have to choose whether the career progression or, or she just have to get married and that's it. Um, I think that that kind of difficulty of finding that kind of role model have such a huge impact on law students um, when they're like thinking about their careers. Um, and that's so important that um, we, we, we create that kind of environment for them to make sure they also find their um, place in the companies they work for. If I can, can add a couple of things. One is that the consumers of, of legal services, the consumers of legal technologies, um, the consumers of our laws um, is an equal opportunity. Um, we, uh, for example, in my company, we, uh, we, we sell to men and women. And it's only fair that uh, people who build the technology are also equally represented. Um, so, you know, I guess I will try to be a little bit more positive and a little bit with the call to action uh, to everyone who is listening and everybody who is part of this discussion. Um, you know, if you want to build a brighter future of law, um, the time to do it is now. The time to do it is in the build stage. If you don't like what you're seeing today, if you, like myself, think that the um, in legal tech combines the worst of tech and the worst of legal, um, then the time to get busy and the um, if we would like to have legal technology that is empathetic uh, toward all users that represent all perspectives that the builders of that technology must also represent the customers. Um, I've seen a number of uh, uh, messages as, as a number of us have been talking about uh, motherhood and how hard it is to combine with uh, being an attorney, being a professional, being a technologist. Um, we, we all know that uh, when we practice law, when you're forced to have um, a situation where you have two choices, uh, that solution to that is you have to find a third. Um, and, and that's what I, um, every time when I talk to law students, when I talk to leaders who somehow afraid that motherhood will um, impact your ability to practice law, your ability to do technology, I invite them to find a third choice. Once I um, was in trial and I was visibly pregnant at the time I was a, a DA for the city and county of San Francisco. And uh, a male judge asked me how my ability um, has been impacted uh, to try the case by the virtue of being pregnant in the, in the courtroom. And I said, uh, Your Honor, uh, while my stomach grows bigger, my brain stays exactly the same. Um, and my has not gotten better or worse, it's exactly the same. Um, so, um, and, and, and that's my invitation to everybody, start building um, and uh, educating uh, the folks around you uh, about uh, ability to show up as a full self, that our real life experiences enhance our abilities. And, um, and in fact, they help us to be professionals um, and give better advice and build better technology. Uh, I, 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 I work um, in, uh, you, you know, I don't know, the government generally are always a little bit behind maybe than, and, and, than, than the private sector. Um, we, I work with a lot of women and, 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 and leadership position, whether, and absolutely in Bahrain, it's the same as I think globally, there are many, many um, law students that are female and they are, you know, exceptional. Uh, many of them, um, and they come into um, the court's administration, um, and they do extremely well. I think one of the biggest challenges, and I think something we just, I think we accept the fact that there will always be um, women in organization, then people can make proper management about this. 
I hear uh, managers um, of courts constantly saying, you know, if I have 100% a group of girls, for example, which because they are the graduate, they are the better ones. Then how do I manage with the fact with maternity leave and and um, and 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 their, you know, um, for example, after sixty days of maternity leave, you get um, two hours, um, you know, like you you kind of automatically work part time um, or two hours less. And so how do I manage workload in the court with something like this? You can't really and and. and and it's a question that people ask genuinely from a female because they, I don't know, I suppose, I suppose you have supposed to have all the answers. But the point is, how do I manage if, you know, half of my staff all go out on maternity leave at the same time, you know? How do I deal with the situation when after 60 weeks or 60 days of maternity leave, they're asking for more leave? And there is a lot of understanding to family in, in the environment that I live, that I work in anyway. There's a lot of understanding to to, to, to family and and um, and the needs for work and life balance. I, th I think that's something they, they're quite good at. But there comes these really challenging management questions that I actually have, have, have found in many situations really hard, hard to deal with. I, I have a 100% female team. I personally are, you know, suffer um, with, with that simple fact because it does, it does happen where your team is all out, you know, um, for whatever reason. Um, and so, and, and I think culturally, in, a, in, in some cultures, you know, the, the demands of family on the female member of the, of, the, of the family, whether as a daughter or as a sister or as a wife, is a lot more than, um, than, than other cultures. Um, and I, and I, I, I lived most of my life in London, and I, I didn't feel that kind of demand, but I see my colleagues are constantly being pulled um, different directions. It, it's really hard for, for many females, I think, um, to to excel um, with the environment that we 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 all work in. Um, however, you know we are all proof that it's possible, and it's it's exactly the point that Olga makes about a third choice. You have to carve the way. There is no doubt it's much harder than ever, than our male counterparts, in my opinion. Um, however, um, it is possible, and 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 it's always been my advice to to students, um, uh, many students that I taught. You just don't give up. Don't let them tell you because you're female, you can't. Don't, don't allow somebody says you have to choose between, you know, having a family and working. You can have both and you can make a balance and, and, and you just have to believe you can. And the more determined you are that you can, the more likely you're going to convince people around you. Now, that doesn't stop people making comments that are unhelpful, um, like the ones that just been said, to use a very, very kind of polite word. However, you, I... I I, I, I hear it quite a lot of the time. I, I actually, most of the time I worked, um, I, was, I was unmarried and I, 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 was, I didn't have a child. And I've only, my child was a year and a half old. Um, obviously my, my, my abilities to work till midnight has disappeared. Um, and I just, I just say, well, I'm really sorry. You know, I'm happy to talk to you at 6 a.m. I can't talk to you at 9 p.m. So you get to choose. I, I'm available at 6 a.m. You're available at 9 p.m. We just have to find another time that suits both of us. And I think with that kind of, I think determination and tenacity, um, I think females have, have got a, a, a great future. And with, with, with our, um, many of the graduates being so much better by the, by, by the, by, than their male counterparts, I think they're just gonna carve their way into the system because there's not gonna be a choice. You're gonna either choose between a female who's very good or a male who's average. And, and most companies is gonna, it's gonna boil down to the fact of, I want the job done. Um, it's just about educating, I think, management, whether female or male, actually, in a lot of ways, about how to deal with, with the challenge of having a female part of your staff and having much more flexibility about remote working um, and dealing with the necessity of life um, and the necessity of, of and, and then I don't call it work and life balance. It's simply the fact that you must have a, something else to do in your life besides you know working even if it's just going to the gym um so for me it's it's important that we all as senior women um show our male counterparts how you manage a team of women or a majority women and how you don't stop the work doesn't stop life you know uh, the, the 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 business doesn't suffer um and everybody gets to do their job so i i think it's it's actually leading by example by many of the female uh, management is actually an essential part of developing uh, this process. I, I, I call it work-life integration. 
<laughs> and I think that's I think that's right, but I think it misses for me an important part because um, what we often do is we focus on women and what women need to do but actually there's nothing wrong with women or women's life choices um, what's wrong is the system and that's what we need to focus on fixing and so so when I do work in, in business I always start with the managing partner the CEO and you know it, inevitably they're a man um, and you know and it is for them to lead on this with or with, with with true authenticity actually because it does have to come from the top and as as you say by by, by way of example but um you know, this is this is something that isn't about um being, that's kind and supportive to women it's it's a hard there's a hard-nosed business case for gender balance and for diversity across the board you know there, there's so much research which evidences that diversity in senior positions equates with greater profitability um, for for business so so it is it's an issue for everybody um, in 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 a business and getting men on board and having it at the heart of business planning and making sure that policies and procedures are right and that they are implemented and implemented effectively. There's no point having a wonderful, in the UK example, equal parenting policy um, if actually no, no men take up that, that parental leave. Um, and, and having and making sure that we're fair all the way through. So work allocation, we found in our research, was a really important, pivotal pipeline issue that um, women were not getting the same opportunities to get in front of a good client, get the great work early on in their career. And, and that led to a, um, a, a, a real diversion of career paths um, later on, when, and particularly when it came to partnerships. So, so I think there are lots of different things that businesses can, can actively, concretely do to ensure that there is a proper level playing field for, for everybody and that's good for them and good for everyone else and you know and great for our mental health as well <laughs> um, it's not just women who want agile flexible working everybody wants that um, and if you t if you remove it as a mummy track you know something that's just about being a, a carer for children or elderly um, then actually you, re you reduce a lot of the, the difficulty and resentment around it as, as well. And remote and flexible working has become a necessity in light of COVID. And uh, it's been interesting to see the juggle um, of males and females having to do the homeschooling plus working. Uh, um, uh, yeah. I, 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 what, what we've seen of COVID is that people are being more vulnerable or okay to be vulnerable to each other. They're okay to share where I think they, um, in the past, they never did. They're, they're always showing that very hard um, very professional part of them, but given that everyone now is working remotely, they're more um, t they're more okay to share the kind of vulnerable stories. As you said, as being uh, they're parenting their child or they're having school, or it, you can listen to the child at the background, possibly in many calls, um, both male and females, I guess. Yeah. I think we are about out of time, um, but um, I'd like to open it up. Maybe we've got a couple questions here. I've been trying to keep my eye as much as possible. Um, I think the questions that I've seen have kind of come around um, uh, advice. Uh, what I think maybe let's leave off here. If you could give maybe one piece of advice on how to enter um, this area of technology, uh, legal tech, law, um, in your very, in, you know, in any capacity, whether it's uh, entrepreneurial, whether it's as a lawyer, whether it's um, whatever it is, what, what advice would you give? Well, for me, for the law students, 
First of all, uh, with respect to what we were discussing earlier, I think law students and female law students need to have role models. So they should be attending panels like this one to see that you know you can have women who have who are married, who have uh, children, who have a successful career at the same time. They can change a career, you know. They can evolve and have a new career after, you know, a, a certain path that they took at the beginning. Um, and then I think uh, students now and young people need to be open-minded. They need to be open-minded because it is good to have a focus, but it is incredibly useful now to, to, to see the big picture as well. I'll give you a very, very briefly an example. I had a female former student of mine. She wasn't the top in her class. She was average student. Then she moved to London. She did one year there. She completed her LLB. Maybe a lower second class. And then she said, can you give me a reference? Because I want to go and, and do a master's in data science. And I can't find a, a lecturer who will give me a reference. I'm like, sure, I will give you one. And now she did it. And uh, it was two or three weeks ago that she sent me her transcript, which was amazing. It was everything was in the 80s, first class marks. So she has now developed a unique skill set. Right? So she has her law degree and she has her data science master's. So she's, she's been able to look at the big picture and I think she can pursue her dream and she can have an incredibly unique career. So that, that is my advice. Be open-minded, have a mentor, look at role models and try to network. I think my, my advice would be, um, come from a different angle, be work out what the pain point is. So find out, what work out what the actual problem is. I find that um, the most effective way um, these days is, is there's been a lot of flurry of excitement around um, in legal tech, around all sorts of different things, which some of them more necessary than others. Um, and I think we're now seeing a bit of a shakedown. I think COVID has been a good thing in some ways in terms of shaking down. I think it's been a bad thing in that law firms have retrenched a little bit, they're not spending, um, and that, but that will hopefully pick up. But I think I would identify, it's all about, for me, identifying real problems and how to fix them. And I think if you've got the knowledge and the um, capability, which let's say that that's really, you know, why you should be involved. Um, if you haven't got it, you can learn it. I'm not being negative at all. But just work out what it is you're trying to, what problem it is that you I, I, I identify with, whether emotionally or whatever reason, and and how, and then work out a way to fix it. And start from that point. Start from what, start from what the problem is, and then work back from there. I think I think one thing um, that's very clear from this panel, I think that's one of the most fascinating thing is every single one of um, the panelists have done varied of things you know they started somewhere they've done something else and then you know it came to legal tech um through m many 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 routes for me certainly it was um it was, it was not certainly not by design and i have done quite i i was a i worked in, in in different industries and and i i've seen the legal system from different angles and i think that that varied experience have helped a lot in able to be delivering change and delivering um, change, um, uh, you know, with technology, because you're, you're you're able to see things a little bit more in 360 degrees, and which I feel like, from my experience, for people that I've worked with, people that have done a very um, straightforward experience seem to find it a lot harder to 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 be agile to these to these uh, to these changes, and to be able to really see how how the technology would um, would serve the process. Um, and, if, and and of course, uh, at the end, the people. So I, I I would say to to females, you know, don't be afraid, or male and female for that matter, don't be afraid to try different things. You know, try different things. Work in in industry, work in practice, work in um, in different companies. Um, see see where, where you fit. And and like the, the 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 lady who went and try, you know, the student that went and did data science, don't be afraid. Go go and and, and try something different. Um, Combining law with anything, most of the time, it's, it's, it's actually comes out with a reasonably good product. It, it is, you know, it is very clear that in law we, we have lots of opportunity, um, I, and I think uh, there is uh, something for everyone to be involved with um, in, in when it comes to law. 
And um, I think the opportunity is so large that we really need all hands on deck. Mothers, excellent students, mediocre students, with or without law degree. There is an opportunity for every passion in this thing called law. And it's about time that we democratize both law and technology. Um, really, in the end of the day, the future belongs to builders. And the best thing you can do if you would like to change today is to be part of building effort. Whatever passion that you have, uh, building is really who write, uh, builders are the people who write history. Uh, builders are the people who have impact uh, and builders who, are, at the end of the day, make a huge change. Yeah. I would personally say, um, especially for younger ones, whether male or females, is um, be confident, but also be humble to listen to um, any piece of advice you actually hear from anyone, regardless whether if you're a lawyer or not. The second part, I think, as Asil said, is um, be very flexible to try as much as you can, whether as a student or even a fresh grad, um, or even as a senior person. There is no age for learning or trying something different and really figuring out what you can do. Um, when I first personally graduated, um, I wanted to be in a private practice because that's what everyone did. And um, I think three years after I practiced, I really was a miserable person. I really didn't enjoy what I was doing. And during that time, if when moving in-house, people like really thought, what on earth are you really trying to do? You're really ruining your career from moving from private practice to in-house now. Um, but I just really felt like, I'll just try it and let me see what I do. And personally, I would say, if I wasn't open-minded enough to do that, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be who I am at the moment. I am now happy with what I'm doing at the moment. Um, so trying something new, be, be open to do something different and new is, is really important um, as a person. Um, yeah, I think, and really be, again, confident, but also be humble to listen to a piece of advice. Um, and there's no age limit for that. It's, it's a journey. It's, it's a marathon more than a sprint and there will be ups and downs, but we just got to keep in there and we've got to support one another and collaborate with one another. And we can do this as women in legal tech. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you all. I, um, I think we're, we're, we're out of time, but I, it's been as amazing of a panel as I expected. I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, I think we'll get a chance to later review this and everyone else can watch it again, or I'm sure more people will watch this later on, but uh, I'll give it back over to Jasmine. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. I'd just like to wrap up by saying, firstly, thank you so much to our panelists. I mean that it, as a young woman myself, hoping to go further into the tech industry, I think it really is quite inspirational to hear your first-hand opportunities and challenges you've all faced in different parts of the legal tech industry as well, not, not just one. So um, a big thank you to all of you for sharing those experiences with us. And thanks, Brian, for moderating this panel and you know leading us with some fantastic questions and the discussion. Um, just quickly, a couple of things. I'd like to say we've got a few questions on um, the recording of this. So yes, all of our webinars are being recorded and they will be edited and available to all of um, attendees and panelists within due course. Um, any more questions you may have for the panelists because I've seen the chat section is um, going off, which I love to see. Um, please contact us at info at Forte Markets if you've got any more questions. Um, and if you were not aware already, this is day one of a three day webinar series. So tomorrow we have um, big data and litigation decision making in light of the pandemic and legal skills of the future. So if you've registered, then we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. However, if you still wish to do so, you are able to by following the link on our website. And um, yep, I think that's all for now. So thank you very much again to our moderator and panelists. And we hope to see you soon. Great. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.